I knew the day after I got diagnosed that the passion and love that I felt for the Walt Disney Company, and I really did, it was an incredible place to work with some incredible toys to get to play with. For a creative person, the creative palette that Walt Disney Imagineering afforded in the theme park world, from documentary filmmaking to immersive interactive attractions to virtual MMOGs like Virtual Magic Kingdom where we had five and a half million kids in a virtual world that we wedded to the real Disney theme parks. We got to break some incredible ground. I got to create a prototype attraction with a free-swimming animatronic dolphin where that dolphin took us out into its world to teach us from the point of view of a dolphin about what the world oceans are about. Those, for a creative person, those were incredible experiences and opportunities. What made you think that you couldn't use that as a, as a platform to, um, to take them on your journey, on your personal journey, yet use a, a large corporation with the support and the exposure to live out your cause? So, I've, for my entire life, I've been able to somehow, for good or bad, be able to manifest what it is that I want to do. I knew that if I wanted to be a Walt Disney Imagineer from the time I was nine years old. It took me a while to get there. The challenge for me and for a lot of people is not figuring out the how to manifest, it's the what to manifest. So I knew the day after I got diagnosed with cancer that I wanted to be in the health and wellness space. It took me about four years to figure out what I wanted to do. Um, building and sharing my own wellness network was a part of it and then getting recruited by the National Cancer Institute to be the first creative director at the National Institutes of Health was the second part of it. So I was able to get an interest-free loan to start my company and the, the wellness network which is under the URL mybridgeforlife.com and we consulted with the National Cancer Institute to rebuild cancer.gov and create what we called the evolution of cancer.gov, which is our federal digital portfolio, the gold standard worldwide of cancer treatment, research, provider information, and patient information. Um, we took the institute into social media, new media, um, but it took me about four years to get to the point where I knew what my vision was and I had the means to to transition out of Disney and still pay for college educations of my kids who were in college at the time. Um, but I knew I would be able to manifest it once I knew what the it was. Along the way, you asked a fascinating question. Why didn't I bring what I had experienced at Disney into the world of healing and health education and health experiences? And I was finally able to. So in meeting a lot of people in that space, I had the incredible opportunity to work with Dr. Leonard Sender, who is my co-founder in Reimagine Well. And we worked together first on some adolescent young adult initiatives uh, that were very exciting to me and great because they took me back to my cousin who passed when we were kids. And my mom was in the adolescent young adult segment when she got diagnosed. It's a segment I have a large amount of passion for, and it's the segment which in the past 20 years since we have been counting has not gotten a serious uptick in five-year survivorship like pediatric and adult cancers have because they always fall through the cracks. It's only 70,000 people in that segment a year that get diagnosed. And the good news is it's only 70,000. The bad news is it's only 70,000. 70,000 to a pharma company developing a treatment is a rounding error. So that segment has its own unique psychosocial needs and Leonard Sender is, a, is, I call him the Bono of adolescent young adult cancer. He's an amazing guy. We worked on some projects together and then he said, let's do a brainstorm and change the way those patients, and while we're at it, pediatric patients too, get treated. Chemotherapy happens in the same way that it did in the 1960s. Patients sit in a room and watch paint peel off a wall. That's an exaggeration. There are televisions usually, some video games, and everyone's got a smart device at this point. But 
We did a brainstorm where I brought together a group of Imagineers and he brought together a group of physicians, oncologists, and hematologists, and we brainstormed how do we change the experience. It just so happened that the next two days later, I was swimming off the coast of Malibu, California on an impossibly clear day. There were dolphin about five or six feet away with their pups and the light bulb went off. I've been a scuba diver my whole life and I went, when I was in treatment, this is where I wanted to be. And the light bulb went off. Wait a second, you used to make rides for Disney. You actually could have been here. Maybe not physically, but in every other way. And I would say the moment where Infusionarium was born, bang, we were there. I went back to Leonard Sender, Lenny, and uh, we said, let's do a proof of concept prototype. And he said, how do we do that? I said, we used to do that at Disney all the time. We're gonna rent a video wall, we're gonna send out, I wanna send out a questionnaire to a large group of pediatric patients and ask them if there are no rules in the universe, including gravity, where's the place that you believe would best promote your healing? Let's see what they come back with. And we did it. And not one said, the hospital. They wanted to be in the ocean, in the sea. That was number one. They wanted to be able to, they said, no gravity? Well, we want to fly like a bird, or maybe even ride a bird, right? How about outer space? International Space Station seems cool. Adolescents, young adults, basically anything a GoPro sports hero does, they wanted to be doing. So we created the top four immersive environments. We did a two-week pilot test, and it went through the roof. Manifestation. Dr. Sender was able to bring through the U.S. president of Hyundai, who looked at it and said, hmm, that's interesting. What does it cost to have that built permanently with our name on it? And uh, we were live within seven months. So you got the investor. Yes. Yeah. Well, we got, yeah, an investor at that point. So we still didn't know that there was a company to be built around this, but immediately there were dramatic emotional changes for pediatric patients in treatment. One Can of my you talk about the benefits? Yes, so let me talk first about the kind of attitudinal and emotional benefits. What's the problem with pediatric cancer treatment? It leaves kids terrified, isolated, depressed. What's the solution? Use immersive, cool technologies to make their journey while they're in treatment enjoyable. Does that have health benefits? We'll find out. Does it have psychosocial benefits? Absolutely, unquestionably. So it's so dehumanizing for an adult or a kid to put your hands in the hands of a hospital who staples a port into your chest, tells you this is the poison we're gonna pump into your system and it's gonna damn near kill you, but in the process it'll kill your cancer before it kills you. You're nauseous, you're throwing up, you're six years old and you're seeing a bag of your blood hanging next to you. It's, it's pretty barbaric. So, to give them some sense of power over their destiny, to say, I don't want to be in this place. I want to be at the beach. I want to be, and, and I'll tell you, our virtual simulations aren't all that sophisticated, but just the empowerment factor of enabling a child to be where they thought they wanted to be, all of a sudden, their side effects started to melt away. And I'm not gonna talk about hard numbers because there is a clinical study in flight, but patients who always needed anxiety meds stopped needing them when they went into treatment. That we kind of expected. The anti-anxiety meds weren't a big surprise. We thought we would help with anxiety. It's when patients stop needing any diarrhea meds, um, anti-abdominal cramping. Um, those are some of the kinds of side effects, treatments and medications that also diminished very quickly afterwards. So, uh, Is that because of the, the endorphins um, in the body doing their work? Is it so, on a scientific level, do you know what the... On a scientific level, I'll tell you, my medical partners would say, it's because of the distraction. Mm. Um, that's powerful then. Imagination, is, that, that's a powerful... There, then, right? there is no question 
that a patient that believes they are a survivor and they have a vision of themselves in the future does better. There is a study from the National Cancer Institute with advanced cancer diagnosed patients and one of the questions they asked was, do you see yourself as an optimist or do you see yourself as a pessimist? The self-declared optimists had a much higher five-year survivor rate. So just optimism matters. Um, seeing yourself in the future and healing yourself by empowerment and education and being a part of a community Traditionally, chemotherapy happens in a room, cubicle, the patients alone, it just feeds their depression, feeds their anxiety, and, and feeds their side effects. If they're in a room, in a collective experience, virtual, or reaching out and going on a virtual field trip to meet people who inspire them, suddenly they're not alone anymore. Mm -hmm. they're, and they're actively participating in creating the environment that they're being healed in, and. We want to believe that that's an important factor in the patient journey.